Standard of California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. Everything is nice. Another adventure at George Valentine. Personal notice. Change is my stock and trade. If you've locked all the doors but your knees still rattle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Dear Mr. Valentine, my daughter has red hair. If you can imagine red hair with the rest of what you see in the photograph, you will understand a father's concern. Vivi is only 18, but she has spent every afternoon and evening of the past week in a disreputable place called Bamboo Bills. Whom she sees there, I don't know, and she won't tell me. However, this is not just an affair of the heart. The 22nd of this month is her mother's birthday, but Vivi insists that she will not be home for that or any other family occasion. Mr. Valentine, my, my daughter isn't bad. She's upset and frightened. We are wealthy people, and I am positive someone has entangled Vivi in a situation too dangerous for her to handle alone. I will expect to hear from you at your earliest convenience. Sincerely, E.F. Sunderman. This afternoon, tourist. Oh, uh, nothing, thanks. I'm just... Yeah. Yeah, I'll give you my order in a minute. Oh, excuse me. All right. It's so bright out on the street and they keep it so dark in here. I I didn't see your gloves there. It's all right. Uh, nice place here, though, isn't it? I said what'll it be this afternoon, tourist. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, let's see. Oh, limit one per customer. Bamboo Bill's Barracuda Bite. Is <laughs> that what you're having? Do I look like a bee girl? Oh, now listen, excuse me. I didn't mean Mine's for... lemonade. Here, Mac. Thanks, Miss Sunderman. I'll take it upstairs with me. Wait, look, really, I didn't mean Ah, it. sit still, tourist. I'll give you something on the house. Huh? <laughs> ah, just a little rain, that's all. Convincing, ain't it? Clear up in a minute. You know how it is in the tropics. Meantime, it kind of uh, washes the air, cools people off. Okay, okay, Chevron. But tell me about this place here. What's upstairs? Where she went? Nothing. Boss's office. Uh huh. Where the stairs? I didn't say the boss was there, sir. All right, all right. So I want to apologize to the girl. What's it to you? Oh, come on, come on. Relax. I ain't got you pegged as a masher, but I've got you pegged as a guy who makes trouble his business. Now, suppose I mix you one of the house and then you go and... Hey, what's that supposed to be? Tropical thunder? Hey, beg pardon. Hey, wait a minute. You just come down those stairs? No, no, no. Uh, I just thought I heard something through here, that's all. Yeah, like shots maybe, huh? Come on, back up the stairs. Oh, oh one side, old chap. Sounds as if somebody's hurt. No, you don't. Wait a minute. Get Sunderman. Miss Sunderman, where are you? Miss. Oh, no. Easy, Valentine, easy. The ambulance is already on its way. Now stop kicking yourself. Oh, well, I can't help it, Riley. If I hadn't got wise and thought I could strike up a conversation with her... She wouldn't have taken a lemonade upstairs. I don't think she's got much chance to pull through. I've always found people who are headed for lead poisoning are going to get it sooner or later, regardless of circumstances. Now, cool off or tell me about that guy once again. Brother, I'll be glad to. Six foot two, slender, English accent, maybe Australian. And he definitely had been upstairs. Uh Uh-huh. Gray suit, black mustache, not much hair. Okay, we'll get the alarm out, and I'll be with you myself in about five minutes. Okay, thanks, Riley. Six feet two, slender, and an English accent. Yeah, that's right. Who are you? My name's Bill McGee. Bamboo Bill? Yeah, yeah, I own the place. Wow, well, lots of excitement here. Where have you been? That's my business. Okay, wait for the police. I don't mix well with policemen. Now look, South Seas merchant. I've been there, I'm no phony. (laughs) Just didn't go back soon enough, did I? 
So the Englishman shot her. He was upstairs. But it's a big place. There might have been others. He did it. Hey, you're pretty sure, aren't you? Okay, what's his name? Who is he? I haven't the slightest idea. Beach boy, you better start getting some ideas. It happened in your office. The Sunderman girl's been here every day of the past week. So what? People will want to know why. They're not going to believe she just came here for travel lectures. You talk too much, tourist. Yeah. And she's been scared of something, upset. Her family was worried about it. Say, uh, how do you get along with her family? I didn't know she had a family. Why don't you cut the hulu? You're trying to make up a story so fast, your head's spinning. You're trying to... Yes, the ambulance. Yeah. Let me tell you one thing, mister. If that kid dies, it's going to mean the ambulance for lots of people. <laughs> Mr. Sunderman, you and your friends will have to go back to the waiting room now. Uh, of course, of course, nurse. Uh, Vivi will tell us, Mr. Valentine. She, she'll tell us as soon as the doctors are through, as soon as she's out of the anesthetic. She may not know who it was, Mr. Sunderman. Those bullets struck her in the back. I mean, even if she... Oh, she she'll be all right. I, I know she will. Of course she will, Mr. Sunderman. Today was her mother's birthday, too, wasn't it? Yes, yes. I, I wanted everything to be so nice today. What do you mean? Isn't everything usually nice? Well, of course, but... Dora! Oh, Ed. Ed, how is she? Now, now, there's nothing we can do. Dora, please. I'm sorry, dear. I, I want you to meet Miss Brooks and Mr. Valentine. Uh, this is Mrs. Sunderman. How do you do? Oh. You're Vivi's mother? <laughs> oh, no. Of course not. I, I wasn't a child bride. I'm just her stepmother. Oh, I see. Ed never tells people. He thinks it's... Well, he just doesn't. No, no, it, it's better not to. We're a family now. Yeah, but I, uh, I wish I'd known. It makes a few things a little clearer. We've been, we've been married nearly two years now and... Mr. And... Valentine was thinking of how Vivi feels about me, darling. Isn't that right? Uh-huh. Well, she hates me, of course. Dora, no, no, please. After all the effort you've made... Oh, maybe I'm overstating a little, but it's natural, isn't it? For a beautiful girl like Vivi and her, uh, her young stepmother not to get along. She's bound to resent me. Well, I'm even attractive to some of her men. Don't you think so, Mr. Valentine? Uh, possibly. But after all, I can't help the way I am. Mrs. Sunderman, the important thing is, Vivi kept to herself. She kept her own secrets. I, I know, I know that's true, but I have no idea what this thing was she was mixed up in. Bill McGee, I... I've never even heard her mention his name. Well, the police will be finding out more about him. And as for this Englishman you saw coming downstairs, her reasons for going to the restaurant in the first place, none of it makes any sense to me. I don't know what to tell you, Mr. Valentine, how to catch my, my own daughter's murderer. Ed, Ed, don't. It's not your fault. But I'm afraid I don't really know anything about Vivi either, Mr. Valentine. I'm sorry I can't help you. Yeah, Mrs. Sunderman, could I see you for a second alone? Of course. He's so upset. He... Yes, I know, I know. Well, I just wanted to tell you, Mrs. Sunderman. Yes? I don't believe you. Goodbye. <laughs> I find out nothing, you find out even less. Well, Lieutenant, I threw a harpoon at Mrs. Sunderman, but I don't know whether it hit anything or not. Well, we had the impression she was trying to protect her husband's feelings or trying to... Oh, golly, I don't know. So do I, Miss Brooks. Say, do you know what happened to that South Seas character, Bill McGee? The big operator with the little answers? Hmm? Well, he's gone, that's what. Huh? Yeah, yeah. I was getting nowhere with him, so I asked him politely to come to headquarters with a couple of the boys. And he just as politely gave them the shake. Yeah, and he's probably in Tahiti by now, laughing up his sarong. Yeah, I wish he were. You see, we found out where Osbert Layden lives. Yeah, wait, now, wait a minute. Who? Uh, yes, yes, we did make progress from A to B. The Englishman's name is Osbert Layden. 
Been in town a couple of years, lives pretty well without working, but behind that, his past is a little too dark for my comfort. What do you mean by that? How should I know? All I can find out is he came from the Orient originally, and my hunch is by way of the confidence game. Uh Uh-huh. And Bill McGee's done a little traveling too, hasn't he? That's what I'm driving at, and he's traveling today. When we went to Layden's place, we found his landlady shaking like a straight man in a George Adams cartoon. Why? Because she had already been visited by McGee and his suntan boys wearing blood in their eyes. Oh, so that's it. Well, our chances of meeting the Englishman alive are a little slim, aren't they? With the sharks after him. Uh, how right you are. Uh, excuse me. Sure. Yeah, Riley speaking. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's here. Just a minute. It's... Uh... Dora Sunderman, she wants to talk to you. Oh, well, 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 rolls to the bait, huh? Hello, Mrs. Sunderman. Mr. Valentine, I want to talk to you. I, we're back at the house now. We haven't heard any more from the hospital. Talk about what, Mrs. Sunderman? Well, Ed is so upset, but he's down in the kitchen now, lighting the candles on the cake, still trying to make everything nice for my birthday. Mr. Valentine, he can't keep his eyes closed forever, can he? It isn't kind to protect him from knowing things, is it? No, it's not. Suppose you just... Mrs. Sunderman. Mrs. Sunderman, what was that? I I don't know. Downstairs. Wait. George? Hey, what's going on there? Mr. Valentine, come quickly. He's dead. My husband's dead! How about it, Riley? Yeah, yeah, he was shot through the window all right. The top of one of the birthday candles was clipped by the bullet. He was standing there behind the table. It lines up all right. Uh Uh-huh. Find anything outside the window? Yeah, man's footprint, but it's not clear enough to do us any good. The doctor got the bullet out. It's the same caliber, and it looks like it's probably from the same gun. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. The same person shot them both, but ho, ho. Uh, get a load of this, my friend. The sergeant tells me one of our prowl cars spotted the Englishman down at the corner of 4th and Main a mile from here. Yeah? At exactly 625. 625? Yeah. And we got here at 630, but you heard that shot on the telephone at 625 on the button. So it couldn't have been the Englishman who did it. But you've got every cop on the force still chasing him. And me. I was dumb enough to let Bill McGee find out about it. So he could take off to get the poor guy first. Oh, relax, will you? Oh, brother, I'm a great guy today. First I chase a girl upstairs so she can get shot. Then her old man is killed. Well, I didn't stumble around for wanting that one. But Riley, if the Englishman turns up a corpse, then I'll have a pretty good score today, won't I? Yeah. Join Valentine and see the morgue. We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. If your car kind of sputters on hills and acts logy in traffic, just try a tank full of Chevron Supreme gasoline. It's specially blended to give smoother performance on hills and under every driving condition. Depend on its ping-free power to give your car faster starts, faster pickup and stop and go traffic, too. And remember, premium quality Chevron Supreme is climate-tailored. Wherever you drive in the West, Chevron Supreme gasoline is blended for that altitude and temperature zone. Try a tank full tomorrow. You'll find you can't buy a better gasoline for today's high-compression engines. Best of all, you're never far from Chevron Supreme. You can get it at standard stations and independent Chevron gas stations where they say and mean we take better care of your car. Everything is sure nice. You are hired by a man named Sunderman because he was worried about his red-headed daughter. She was in some sort of trouble, but no one seems to know what kind of trouble. The girl herself is shot, and her father, who started this idea of wanting everything to be nice, is murdered by the same gun. 
Well, if your name is George Valentine, you know that this is no time to be sitting around counting birthday candles. Mrs. Sunderman, we're going to start at the beginning. Wherever you like. Oh, no, no. Wherever you like. You're the one who knows things. Well, I don't know who killed anyone. Yes, yes. We've been through that much. I mean the beginning of what was wrong with Vivi. Oh. Well, uh, Vivi isn't wild, if that's what you mean. In fact, I think she's always looked down her nose a little at me. You know how girls are. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, Mrs. Sunderman, your husband liked to, well, to pretend he had one big happy family. Perhaps. Uh Uh-huh. And uh, you like to help him do it. What? I don't believe that a woman wouldn't investigate what her stepdaughter was up to. Well, I've never actually... Come on, come on, come on. You started to tell me once on the phone. Yes, but so much has happened. I heard that shot. I'm asking about Vivi. What was it about her you didn't want Mr. Sunderman to know? Well, it's... It's something to do with that Bill McGee. She's scared to death of him. She has money, you know, a big allowance. Go on. Well... I don't want to cause any more trouble Look, for her. I'm the one who does that. Go on, go on. There are some papers he has. She wants them. Paper? Is evidence of some sort. I should imagine of gambling, wouldn't you? Oh, I don't know, Mrs. Sunderman. I'm not using my imagination anymore. I just now quit. Yeah, here you are. Thanks. Oh, wait a minute, sir. The main dining room's through the other way, and the tropical bar's just to your right. Oh, yeah, sure. I'll be there in a minute. But you're going the wrong way, sir. Charlie! Papers. Hmm. Look what the monsoon blew in. Well, Valentine. Yeah, now just stand there. And keep standing there. You're through traveling for a while, McGee. Oh, cut it out. Cut it out, will you? I'm not packing your gun. I'm not going anyplace now. <laughs> That's an understatement. But you know, I didn't quite expect to find you coming back to your own office. Not with the bloodhounds after you. Why not? The hot spot's the safe spot, isn't it? Pretty clear, aren't you? I've always been able to take care of myself. Uh-huh. You and your boys, the bartender, the suntan kids. They're all right. They stick by me. Sailors, most of them. Guys I've known in the islands and around. They show up, I give them jobs. Oh, sure, sure. Like uh, taking care of the Englishman? We couldn't find him. Oh, brother, you take a load off my mind. All right, let's talk about gambling. What? Gambling. Like girls with too much dough do sometimes. I still don't get you. Okay. Then we'll make it papers. A piece of evidence you have that might be interesting. Oh. Look, Valentine, you've got to understand something. I came to the States, I opened this place to raise money. There's a trading company down in the Celebes. We need a couple of new boats. That's what I like, see? The green places, they, they get in your blood. The reefs and the blue water. And... <laughs> You're a one-man traveler. Now, listen girl. to me. There was another reason I came, too. It'll sound silly to you, but I came to get me a wife. Yeah, I did. I thought I'd found someone until things began to go wrong. You mean someone like Vivi? Yeah. Yeah, but things went wrong, you see. And then today, when the Englishman shot her... Who says he shot her? Huh? Well, you saw him coming downstairs. You put the finger on him. Now, get this straight, Buster. Vivi was shot by the same gun, by the same guy who killed her father. What? But her father was shot at exactly 625 tonight. And at that time, the Englishman was a mile away. Who says so? I heard the shot on the telephone. It was a police who saw and almost caught Layton. He's got a perfect alibi. Now, tell me his story. Okay. Okay, Valentine. I'll show you the piece of paper. That evidence you're looking for. Well, that's more like it. It's through here in the next room. I'll tell you the truth, Valentine. I'll show you what it is, and I'll shrink you. <laughs> I still take care of myself, tourist. Oh, 
those papers. I don't find those papers. There's something in the other room. Come on, wake up, Valentine. I'm trying to tell you my boys have got him. They've cornered the Englishman. We're going out there. He's alive, George. He's all right. McGee didn't get him. He didn't even get away from here. A piece of paper. Oh, for the love of Mike, there's no papers here. McGee would have taken them after he slugged you, don't you see? George, are you all right? Well, don't try to move. No, no, I gotta see it. Piece of paper someplace, Uh, someplace in here. He said it was. The (laughs) wastebasket. Sure, sure, the wastebasket. I thought there was paper, all right. Hey, it's been burned in the wastebasket. All right, so he burned it. Hey, look, how long have I been out? Just a few minutes. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, ashes cold, scattered, settled. You want to bet this was burned hours ago? No, I don't. I just want to get out there where my boys are picking up the Englishman. Okay, okay, go ahead, Riley. But when I think of how many birthday parties I've been to and how unobservant people can be... George, what in the name... Angel, you and I are going to do a little burning ourselves. In fact, here's our chance to prove you can't burn a candle at both ends. Now, look, Valentine, you have to listen to me. Oh, shut up, Beach Boy. I've heard enough out of you. Besides, you're blowing on the candle. Lieutenant, what on earth is this nonsense? Well, you see... I'm perfectly willing to tell you my story. Why it was I seemed to be mixed up in this thing. Thanks, Mr. Layden. You had me worried for a while, but now I'm not interested. What's the time, Angel? Four minutes. Uh Uh-huh. About a third gone, isn't it? But, but mm-hmm. birthday candles, really, old boy. The, it's Mrs. The... Sunderman's birthday, Mr. Layden. Didn't you know? Huh? <laughs> Why, no. Why should I? Englishman, in about two seconds... Okay, I'm take McGee, you... sit still. Now, calm down, all of you, will you? Just watch the little candle burn. That's what Mr. Sunderman was doing, you know. When someone stood outside the kitchen window and shot him. Uh-huh. He just lit the candles, as a matter of fact... At least the bullet had clipped the top of one of them. Yes, and the rest of them were just burning out when we got here. Uh, that was about 6.30, wasn't it, Riley? It was exactly 6.30. Oh, yes, and, and when you telephoned, Mrs. Sunderman, when we heard the shot... That was exactly 6.25. But look here, Sunderman was killed at 6.25. You told me, Lieutenant, it was the same time when those chaps of yours saw Yes, me. yes, yes, that's right. Between 6.25 and 6.30 is five minutes. How long is it now, Angel? Five minutes. You know, that's very funny. Sunderman's candles burn down in five minutes. But now this one is just the same, and it isn't even half gone yet. Well, maybe uh, maybe he lit them earlier. Or maybe he was shot earlier. I, I didn't look at my watch, but I was talking to you on the telephone yes, when it Mrs. happened. Yes, Mr. Sunderman, I heard something that sounded like a shot as far away as the kitchen. Uh, throw me that pillow, Angel. Mm. Here, George. And uh, here's the gun. Mm -hmm, Thanks. You know, it's pretty easy. You stick a gun into a pillow or something else soft and... Well, listen. Maybe that's how you made that sound, Mrs. Sunderman. No, no, I didn't kill him. I didn't. I swear I didn't. He didn't say you killed him. Of course you didn't. Otherwise, why would you have gone to all that trouble? Oh, no, you were setting up an alibi, weren't you? A perfect alibi for somebody else. But, but, but... I was more than a mile away. Sure. How long is it now, Angel? Seven minutes. A birthday candle takes a good ten minutes to burn, Mr. Layden. Ten from 6.30 is 6.20. The real time you kill Mr. Sunderman. No. Okay. She gave you a five-minute head start. You knew that's all you needed to drive you a mile for the alibi. But, Mr. Valentine, you really can't... Be quiet! Stop it! I won't be quiet. I won't let them railroad me into... Stop it! Stop it! Every time you open up your mouth... You're in it as much as I am, Dora. You egg me on. No, no! Stop it! You persuaded me to kill. Okay, Riley, there you are. The Gingham Dog and the Calico Cat. Now look here, Valentine. Yeah, yeah. Now we'll let you talk, McGee. Wait. Let me tell you something, young man. This idea you've got that you can take care of things yourself... I was only trying to protect Vivi and her father. Holding back information that only the law should have. Yeah, but I was on a spot. If you hadn't broken that alibi, Valentine, I would have been a patsy. That's yeah. what they picked me for. I know, I know. You mean you couldn't prove anything. It was your word against theirs. After that paper had been burned. Yeah, that's right. That's why I wanted to find the Englishman myself. Well, that paper didn't have anything to do with Vivi, did it? No, no, of course not. It was something I just happened to have because I've knocked around in the Orient because I know a lot of people. Did you know Layden in the Orient? Well, I'd met both of them there, him and Dora. But I had no idea they were in the States until I met Vivi and she showed me a picture of her stepmother. Uh-huh. 
And then when Vivi began throwing hints around at home, Tora got worried, huh? Yeah, that's about it. She knew that Vivi already knew and that Mr. Sunderman was already beginning to guess. Knew what? Guess what? What was in the paper? Just a letter, really, but it showed that Osbert Layden was Dora's husband. Is Dora's husband. Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah, a sweet, simple little racket that could have gone on for life. Layden lived on the fat of the land while his wife was also the wife of a rich guy named Sunderman. <laughs> a guy whose only wish in life was that everything be nice. <laughs> no worry, Valentine. The doctors say Vivi will be all right. And I'll be very nice to her. You know, George, I'm very impressed. Hmm? Logic and alibis and everything. But really, I could have told you a long time ago that Mrs. Sunderman was just telling us one story after another. That she was a liar. That she's a... Just, uh, what do you mean? Well, after all, didn't you count those candles on her birthday cake? Twenty-six, really. <laughs> yeah, but then think how many women in the world tell little lies like that. Hmm? Yeah, well, I mean... Well, uh, for future reference, exactly how old are you, Brooksy? <laughs> Good night, George. If you were out on a motoring trip last month, I'll bet you thought more than once that your car's engine was getting a lot of wear. But actually, before you start on a trip and after you come back, the engine probably gets its worst beating. That's because 80% of all engine wear occurs in an idle engine, the result of acid-laden moisture forming on cylinder walls the moment you cut the ignition. It's known as internal engine rust, and the one sure way to stop it is to use compounded RPM motor oil. RPM contains an adhering agent which keeps a moisture-proof oil film on cylinder walls. Rust just can't get started, even though your car stands idle for days or weeks. No wonder premium quality RPM is first choice in the West. It's the oil that stops 80% of engine wear. So to protect your car's engine from rust, depend on RPM motor oil. Ask for it at independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations, where they say and mean... We take better care of your car. Next week, George Valentine pays a call on the local sheriff and gets quite a shock when he hears... Yes, yes, yes. Blood on the fenders. Blood on the fenders. Wife ran over Jackrabbit once. Now, look, Mr. Simpson, you represent the law in this county, and it's... I know, I know. Uh, the boy in the city gave me a call about you. I asked him to. Now, look, I know blood on a fender can be lots of things. But a guy wouldn't be so touchy about it unless it was human blood, would he? It was human blood. But you aren't going to do anything about it, Mr. Valentine. <laughs> Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Robert Bailey is starred as George with Francis Robinson as Brooksy. Wally Mayer appears as Lieutenant Riley. Let George Do It is written by David Victor and Jackson Gillis and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Herbert Rawlinson as Sunderman, Virginia Eiler as Vivi, Dick Ryan as Mac, Dan O'Herlihy as Layden, Larry Dobkin as McGee, and Shirley Mitchell as Dora. The music is composed and presented by Eddie Dunstetter. Your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. 